Hi, and welcome to module six. In this one, we're going to talk about properties of sets and real numbers. Um, I said in a previous module that I wasn't going to generally use slides. In this case, since we're primarily going to be talking about definitions and certain properties, I put up a little bullet point slide of all the different definitions, and I'll write next to it to show what each one is. Um, here is more of an over overview kind of kind of idea, which we're going to talk about different properties to get, you get a feel for what they are. A lot of these are very intuitive, and a lot of these you've seen before if you haven't actually given them the name. So we'll go pretty fast through this um, for some background. Okay. So, first one, the associated property. You know, underline each one. The associated property. The associated property tells you how you can associate um, operations, basically. So, the first three of these properties are generally associated with, with, with well, anything, but, but real numbers in general. Um, the associate property says more or less this. Um, so if you wanted to add x plus y plus z, for instance, you could add x plus y plus z, or you could add x plus y plus z. You can associate different um, operations together. Same thing with, with multiplication. If you had x, y, z, you could do x, y, then z, or x, y, z. Um, that's more or less association. It's not commonly used a lot because it's pretty self-explanatory, and you just use it more or less by rote without thinking too hard about it. Okay. So it's associative. Commutative. The commutative property um, is one in which you have a x y equals y x or x plus y equals y plus x. Commute means to sort of flip the order of. Now you might notice I've been writing both pluses and multiplication. The reason is these properties generally apply to a particular operation. So I showed you the associative property of addition and the commutative property of addition and also the associative property of multiplication and the commutative property of multiplication. Um, they're related to individual properties. The, associate, um, the community property of addition would generally hold in all cases. We'll see when we deal with matrix multiplication in linear algebra, in the linear algebra part, that matrix multiplication does not commute. So if A and B are matrices, and we'll talk about what matrices are much later in the course, it is not the case that that's true, and we'll see why that is. And we'll d develop terms like left multiplication and right multiplication and so on. But that's for much later. Um, in general, real numbers commute, either additively or multiplicatively. Okay. Distributive property combines sort of addition and multiplication to look like this. So if I have x times the sum of y plus c, if the distributive property holds, as it does for real numbers and integers too, then that's equal to this. I can distribute out the x across the sum. That's it. The identity property is more generally interesting, I think, in a lot of cases. Um, the distrib distributive property comes up a bunch in just general algebra, and we'll do some of that um, shortly. But the identity property has some sort of deeper um, notions. Some identities you've seen already. So if I add 0 to 1, say, I get back 1. If I add 0 to 3, I get back 3. 0 um, is an additive kind of identity. It lets you stay with the number you had before. 1 is a multiplicative identity. So 1 times 1 equals 1. 3 times 1 equals 3. It lets you keep what you had before. So it's the identity. Um, you can define more, co more complex identities, like identity function. Right? Identity function, and we'll do functions um, in the next video lecture, it could look like that which means if you put in an x, you get back your x. It's an identity. In all cases, an identity gives you back what you started with. That's what identity means. Inverse. 
the inverse is something you can apply to a number to produce the identity. So we talked a little bit about negative numbers and how they are an inverse for positive numbers. That's an additive inverse. So if I take 3 and I add negative 3, I get 0, which is the additive identity. What about for multiplication? Well, and that works both ways, right? If I have negative 3, the additive inverse to negative 3 is positive 3. That also gives me 0. What about multiplication? Well, if I start with 5, what gives me 1, which is the multiplicative identity? Well, if I divide by 5, 5 divided by 5 is 1. So if I multiply by 1 fifth, I get back 1. There you go. So in general, 1 over the number is the multiplicative identity. Now, there's some issue there. What about for 0? 0 doesn't have a multiplicative identity. 1 over 0 is undefined. In general, you can't divide by 0. Division by 0 has no actual meaning. Um, 1 over 0 explodes. It goes to infinity, but it's undefined. Um, 0 over 0 is undefined also. Um, sometimes you can do things with it, as we'll talk about later. But in general, 0 over 0 is also undefined. You just can't divide by 0. So 0 has no multiplicative identity. But all other real numbers have a multiplicative identity equal to 1 over that number. So pi times 1 over pi equals 1, even though pi is odd. right? It still has a multiplicative identity. Um, and that's an inverse. And inverse functions exist too. We'll deal with them when we get to inverses, but you write them like this. Negative 1 um, means inverse in this case. Okay. So some things have inverses, some things don't. Okay. Additive inverses are easier because you just take the negative of that thing. Okay. Now, um, the rest of these we've dealt with, most of these already, um, in terms of sets. Finite, a finite set is a set with a number of things that has a, a limit, a, an ending point. Right? Sorry, a bound. A limit is a bad word here. A bound. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you stop there, that's a finite set. If it goes on forever, it's an infinite set. Infinite just means there's no end to what you're doing. Finite means there is an end. Sometimes it can be a little tricky. If you're talking about um, a, set, a set in which the number of points in the set is finite, that is a finite set. It consists of the points 0 and 1. This is an infinite set. It contains all the points from 0 to 1, but there's an infinite number of points in the real numbers between 0 and 1. So this set is an infinite set. That set, the top one is a finite set. The bottom one is an infinite set. Um, but finite and infinite otherwise just mean what they normally mean in English. A finite group is a group that has a set, a, a limited number of things. An infinite group is a set that has no limit to the number of things. It's just the same definition as English. Okay. Countable and uncountable we've also talked about. A countable set is a set in which you can identify each element in the set with a particular integer. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. You can have an infinite number of these things that are still countable. The integers are countable, almost by definition. You can Each integer is associated with itself, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. There's an infinite number of them. They go on forever, but um, they're countable. I can count them. In contrast, the real numbers are not countable. I can't identify each number in the real number line with a particular integer because there's always other points in there I would have to identify. It goes on forever. It's, it's dense, in a sense, um, in the line. So the real numbers are uncountable. I can't count them. I can't assign a 1, 2, 3 to every element of the real numbers. Some of the sets you deal with, you deal with in political science are countable. Right? Anything that's an integer is countable. Um, so anything that's a category is usually countable. We don't have infinite categories usually. So you might have seven responses to a survey question, um, or you know, 
five possible locations to live or whatever. These are all, you know, or 50 states. These are all countable things um, or set number of countries. Whereas something like um, GDP is in theory uncountable because you can separate a penny down infinitely much. Well, in practice, there's a cutoff. Um, but that would be uncountable. Um, close related to, to countable and uncountable is the concept of cardinality. Cardinality is the size of a set. If a set, a set has three elements, it has a cardinality of three. If a set has infinite elements, it has a cardinality of infinity. Um, this comes up a bunch when you do solution sets. Solution sets might have one solution or two solutions or three solutions. They have different cardinalities. Bounds. Bounds are limits to a set. Again, limits is probably a bad word to use here, but in general, a bound is a boundary. It's a boundary to a set. So the simplest way is thinking of a circle. If this is set A, it's bounded. Everything in there is A. Nothing outside of A is an A, so it's bounded. This set may be infinite, but it's bounded. It does not go lower than 0 and does not go higher than 1. This set is unbounded. It goes on forever. It's infinitely long. It goes on forever. Um, so it's an unbounded set. Bounds are probably the most intuitive set property you can think of. It just If it's contained in some fashion, if it doesn't go beyond some point, it's bounded. If it goes on forever, in any direction, in any context, it's unbounded. That's it. Now, it turns out most of the stuff we deal with when we deal with real numbers is not actually just a set. It's a set with certain additional properties. The most basic of these properties is distance, the distance between any two points. It turns out if you go through the math, um, formally, distance doesn't have to be defined in any particular way. Um, but typically, distance is defined in a particular fashion, the old Euclidean distance. So for instance, if I take two points, and this is a graph. This is called the x-axis. This is the y-axis. I draw a point as an ordered pair. This means x is 3 and y is 2. I could also use x1 and x2 for x and y. That's typically done. So I go, see if these are ticks, and I'm not going to do a good job making this um, equal. Then this is the point that I drew. Um, and if I draw another point down here at 1, 1, the distance between these two points is the length of this line. And that's over here, 3 minus 1 squared plus 2 minus 1 squared, the square root, which we'll get to all the new functions. Um, and that's going to equal 2, so it's square root of 4 plus 1, or the square root of 5 is the distance there. So these are, that's the normal Euclidean distance it's called, because this space is a Euclidean space, it's called. Um, it doesn't come up that much in political science, so don't worry too much about that. It's, the way of it's just the way of defining distance that's common to ge geometric stuff that we've been dealing with so far in, in life. Putting together the distance measure with the set of, say, real numbers gives us a space, Euclidean space. So typically, Euclidean space is a three-dimensional space. Remember we talked about that before. R3. It's a Euclidean space that comprises the real numbers in three dimensions with a measure for distance between them. The common measure, which is typically written like this. So if you have two points, x and y, you take the first component, the second component, and the third component, and that's the distance. Again, again, don't worry too much about that. It's the distance between two points. Um, well, we'll do length a little bit. A little bit. We'll do length and stuff later. Um, we'll do the new algebra, but that's the distance between two points. And that distance measure associated with a set of real, of real numbers in three dimensions gives you a space. In this class, there'll be a few spaces we deal with. Um, there'll be a solution space, there'll be a vector space in your algebra. 
and we get to those spaces, we'll talk about them much more. Each space has its own properties associated with it. But in general, a space is like a set with other properties attached to it, notably distance. And that's most of it. Um, just in conclusion, in this particular module, I want to note other ways of writing more complicated sets. Um, so for instance, just like I have three-dimensional space, I could have a three-dimensional cube from zero to one. It goes from zero to one in one dimension, and also the other dimension, and a third dimension. So it's a cube. It's a, it's a cube of volume one that sits between zero and one in all dimensions. It's, you can also use a different operator. So we have, again, this, which represents a three-dimensional cube. This also can be written like so, where these multiplication signs are actually Cartesian products. They take smaller spaces and merge them into larger spaces. So you have these, these one-dimensional spaces by themselves. The Cartesian product basically multiplies them together in the sense that you start with one dimension, add a second dimension, then add a third dimension coming out to get a three-dimensional cube. It allows you to build smaller spaces from bigger spaces. This notation is primarily seen when we look at functions. When the function might be of more than one variable, we can merge the different um, spaces that are in together. So we might have a function of a, of the domain a and b, that goes somewhere else to c. This notation will be much clearer to you when we deal with functions in the next um, video lecture. Anyway, that covers it for today, um, for this module rather. Um, the next three lecture modules will be on algebra. The key thing to remember in algebra is just really practice. The more you practice, the better you get at it. So if you have any kind of worry about your algebra skills, watch these modules, and then go and please take extra special attention on the problem sets and the problem sessions to really get a handle and, and practice and review your, your earlier skills in algebra because it'll come back to you pretty fast. And that's it. Um, thank you very much.